So we're standing right outside the shop and as you can see there's the rat jeep has been pushed over there and you can literally see the piles of crap, literally crap, and straw and grass and whatever else that mice packed into that thing. It took them over a day to get everything dug out and there's just piles and piles of stuff. So let's take a look at the piles and then let's head over to the engine bay on that thing. So I do apologize for the wind noise as usual here in Kansas. It's pretty windy and I have Crazy D with me today. Hey guys. This is actually his Jeep. He's selling us the motor out of it and you've got other plans for the rest. So if anybody is interested in the body, the transmission, with what's left after the motor's out, they want to LS swap it or build a mudder or rock crawler out of it, I will sell you the body for a grand. Just can just contact me here in the office and if they want to send a shipper or whatever, we can load it. We can get it loaded easy for them and get it on the way. So yeah. That sounds good. That's quite a bunch of piles that came out of it, isn't it? That is quite the mess, isn't it? Tons. It's like fur, bones, poop, sticks. Lots of walnuts. It's very organic. <laughs> it is. It's actually eco-friendly. <laughs> it is. It's very eco-friendly. Besides the little bits of, um, well, the carpet and <laughs> yeah. whatever else the pack rats had dragged there. They repurposed it. They did. They did a fine job. Yes. Lots of repurposing going on there. Let's take a look in the engine bay and see what it looks like now. So you, now you can actually see an engine. They've dug a lot of stuff out of there. Yeah, you can see they chewed all the wires up. They chewed a lot of vacuum lines. Sometimes I've seen them chew the belts, but they didn't chew the belts on this one. That's what we're after on this, on the, uh, the nice blue Jeep that's in there. We just need the engine block. I don't care about the rest. We're gonna pull that out. I will, in the parts and accessories we don't use, I will put them in the back of the Jeep. So whoever buys this, the remainder of this Jeep from Crazy D will also get those parts with it. We just need the block. Maybe a few internal pieces other than that, but that's about it. Well, there it is. That's what the Jeep looks like. And you heard that the rest is for sale. Now let's get back inside and out of this crazy wind. So here is the remainder of those Jeep parts. You guys have seen the video on that. It's a catastrophe. It's really bad. As soon as we get the block and pieces out of the rat Jeep we just looked at, we're putting it all together with this stuff and it's going on a truck to Wichita to my builder and we'll finally get a good motor. But speaking of old vehicles, we're going to take a look at this 1990 Ford F-150 today. These are the best Ford trucks ever built, especially if they got the straight six in them. I had one, I bought it, it had 8,900 miles on it, and when I finally quit driving it, it was over 300,000, and the truck could have probably gave me another two or 300,000. They are really good trucks, but they don't have OBD2, and it makes it tougher to diagnose, which- it's harder on you guys. Yeah, which we can diagnose here, but the average backyard mechanic, they have a lot of struggles with these. I've seen a lot of things. We're gonna talk about that here in a minute, but take Crazy D's advice. If you're looking for a cheap, older truck, these trucks are really good, especially with the inline six. This is where Crazy D fades away. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. All right, let's see the yep. tomorrow morning. Okay. So just like I just mentioned, this is a 1990 Ford F-150. It does not have the 4.9 inline six. It does have the five liter 302 V8. You could have gotten the inline six, the five liter or the 5.8. And if you step up to an F-250, they had the 6.9 or the 7.3 international non-turbo diesels. This is a pre-power stroke, but we're gonna focus on this one today. And a lot of the pitfalls, backyard mechanics, they don't have scan tools or things to hook to OBD-1 and this is one of those eras of trucks or cars especially at the late 80s early 90s that most people choose the shotgun approach it's idling rough it's idling high it's doing something strange I'll just go and help AutoZone clear their shelves and I'll buy this part and buy this part and I'll try this and I'll try that uh, it didn't work I guess I got to take it to the mechanic this one's actually owned by a local high school kid and he has come to the assumption, as many of us have as well, two or three years ago, this truck wouldn't be worth much. It wouldn't be worth putting $500 into. But he made the comment, he's like, I can't go buy another truck. 
They're 10 grand and up to 50 for old trucks. He's like, this is a weird time, but it actually makes sense to possibly put a couple grand into this thing and get it back on the road. It is running fine. He just has a high idle and it runs a little rough. And we have taken care of some of the issues. There's still more to look at. But let's take a look at it first. So usually we have some pretty crazy cars in the shop. We do videos on some really expensive cars, but today we're gonna to take a look at, it's not really a beater, but it's just an old truck. And definitely you can tell that it's not in its prime. It has a black hood and the rest of it's got a two-tone beige. And what is that, a maroon? That's definitely a 90s maroon. 90s maroon, yep. It's not caved in or dented on the front. It's actually pretty decent. You can see on this fender here that they actually did some repainting. The striping is not there and you can tell the colors. This is a little bit shinier. It's close enough for this type of a truck. It doesn't need to be Concorde quality. There's some things like the, the molding coming loose. This is also the era of Ford trucks that everything that they made, F-150, 250, it didn't matter the engine choice. They love to do dual fuel tanks. And the rear one is always bad. It doesn't work. The fuel pump or the fuel gauge or something goes wrong and they, you always hear about, oh, I'm just running off the front tank. The other one's not working. That, I hear that over and over on these old trucks. I'm not sure if either of these have any issues. The customer is just concerned with a high idle, so we're not going to dive into that. No reason to rack up a bill when it's not been requested. In the back, it's looking pretty decent. It has a little bit of corrosion or something going on there, but it is what it is. And down this side, it's not severely rusted out right here like so many trucks are today. This one's actually holding up pretty decent as far as rust is concerned. There's some paint peeling off here. Looks like it was scraped off. And F-150 emblem's missing here. But all in all, it looks presentable. It looks decent for what it's meant to do. Let's take a look at the interior. Well, welcome, ladies and gents. And if we look there, we always start with mileage. It says 83,000, but I'm guessing this is more like 183,000. I think it's probably rolled over once. But otherwise, a little dusty in here, but it's in really good shape. I'm quite familiar, actually, with, you know, the late 80s, early 90s Ford truck. I drove one for several years in high school. So standard Kansas girl kind of thing, driving a truck. But as you see, no tears, no breaks. Got a little bit of an issue there on the window. Looks like you might have had some leaks going on over there. I know that when I had mine, the window motor did go out. And that, of course, is so much fun to get replaced, poking your hands through those little holes in the door panel. They have added an aftermarket stereo. It does look like they've got a Sony with Bluetooth capability, so that definitely makes this experience a little bit more kid-friendly. We do have a bench seat with a pretty impressive armrest that looks like it has not been used too terribly much. A little bit of a stain over there, but not too bad. But again, no tears, no major problems with anything on the seats. Now, new thing say up there on that headliner. Yeah, it's uh, got a few issues. But the solution for a truck this age is either deal with it or rip it down. And, you know, same thing with the visors. So obviously the headliners are not doing so good. Everything hanging from the ceiling is being affected by gravity. And again, it probably is one of those cases where it could just probably be removed. Door card on this side is looking great. Got a little bit of wear on it because again, it's been open probably 10 million times and closed 10 million times. So it does have some wear and some grime. But other than that, functionality wise, this thing's looking really good. Steering wheel is good. Got just simple controls on there because again, this is the 90s and it does have a cover on here. But again, as always, we don't take those off. Almost don't even really notice it. It's really a nice match for this aged vehicle. Otherwise, let's get to the nitty gritty of why this thing is in here. This is our venerable five liter Ford V8, which is basically a 302. The architecture for the 302 or the 289 has been around since the 60s and is still being used even here in 1990. It's a very good engine. 
really, really a good engine. This one's here for high idle and a little bit of a rough idle. These engines can be very difficult to diagnose. One of the main reasons is it's not as easy to check the codes. You can do it through the check engine light, kind of like the OBD1 style where you count the flashes and everything. But looking at data and checking out the numbers can be a lot more difficult. There can be things wrong with these older systems that don't even trigger a check engine light or any codes, but yet have major symptoms. And that's where a lot of people get into trouble with these and they start doing the parts replacement thing. There are multiple sensors with this fuel injection system that can be faulty or have errant readings that can cause a slew of symptoms, but you're not going to find it through counting flashes on the dash. You're not going to find it by hooking a scan tool to it because a lot of the scan tools that were used that can read the data off this don't even exist anymore. Some of the old Ford scan tools at a shop that I used to work at, they actually had the old stuff. But if you want to go out and buy it, you, you really can't even find that stuff anymore. You can use a voltmeter and go around and physically check everything. And that's typically what most shops do these days. If you bring in an old 1990 Honda or a Ford or whatever, they're obviously not going to have the 1990 scan tool for it. What they're going to have is an oscilloscope or just your handy dandy voltmeter. And they'll go around and They'll get the list of what the reading should be at this position or at this temperature or whatever it should be voltage wise and then they'll compare it by the readings they actually get and they can condemn a sensor's bad or a solenoid is bad or something along those lines. A lot of the things that can go wrong with these are going to be electrical although half of the problem with this truck was electrical the other half is not. But it's definitely one of those issues where you don't want to just go buy the parts from your local parts store and just say maybe this will work because they're not going to take it back and believe it or not they're trained to see if you've used that part or not they'll look inside the pins on the old part and see if there's scrape marks on the pins where the connector's been connected and if they see the scrape marks they'll just give it back to you and go nope not happening here keep it it's yours so the parts cannon it's not your friend with this car. You could go through five, six, seven different parts and still have the same symptoms, the same problems. And that's kind of what happened here and I don't blame the young guy. He's trying to fix his truck. He doesn't want to put tons of money into it unless he absolutely has to, which he does in this point to get it right. I was his age years ago and I didn't always want to take my truck or car to the shop. I thought, well, maybe I can figure this out myself. He actually was in the right ballpark. They just didn't have the test equipment to figure out what was wrong. This thing had a surging idle. It would sit there and go whoo, 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 over and over. It also, when it finally would kind of settle down, it would be clear up to 2,000 RPMs almost. And just sit there all the time, 1,800. Never would come back down. There's multiple things that can cause this on this vehicle's so you guys like to play the guessing game and see if you can figure it out. I'll list four parts or four sensors or whatever on this engine and you can tell me, yeah, that's it or no, that's not it. So we'll start off with number one, the crankshaft position sensor. Is it number two, the map sensor? Is it number three, the fuel pump? Or is it number four, the throttle position sensor? So if you guessed the crank sensor, that's not correct. Crank sensors do not give intermittent problems. They do not change the idle. They do not change the fuel pressure. They either work or they don't. If your crank sensor goes bad, your engine dies, or it won't start. If it works, it will start and it will run. There is no in-between with a crank sensor. So number two, could it be the MAP sensor? If you guessed that, you are half correct. The MAP sensor, after we checked with voltages, with voltmeters, we found there was some strange readings going on with it. 
it would actually just sit there at idle and the readings would change and nothing had changed, the vacuum hadn't changed. And here I have the old one. This is your old run-of-the-mill Ford map sensor. They use these on Ford Escorts, Ford trucks, Ford Tauruses. This is a very common part. You can see where the vacuum line hooks up right there. And you can see the pins in there. That's what they'll look at at the parts store if you try to take back a part you use. They'll look inside of there with a flashlight. I'll demonstrate. They'll look at the pins just like I'm doing here and I can see scrape marks like lines on the pins and they'll hand it back and say, nope, it's yours, buddy. So we replaced the map sensor with a new one and the surging idle went away completely. It also reduced the idle a little bit, around 12, 1400. It greatly improved the situation, but it didn't solve it all together. If you guess number three, the fuel pump, that was wrong. It can cause issues that are intermittent. It can have low fuel pressure. It's really not gonna have too high a fuel pressure unless something's wrong with the fuel pressure regulator. And if it's dead altogether, it just won't start at all. But a high idle is typically not going to be caused by a fuel pump. So that one was wrong. And number four, if you guess the throttle position sensor, that is a possibility. However, the customer has already replaced that and we verified it with a voltmeter and checked it and it's good. I'm gonna take this little cover off real quick for you guys and show you a couple more things that we did. These are the years of the 5.5 millimeter. Ford used them in places and General Motors loved to use them. So we cannot see our throttle position sensor here, but what you can see is the idle stop screw. I'll move this out of the way and you can see a little screw down there. That is the base idle adjustment. The way you set these is you disconnect the idle motor, which you can see they've also replaced, which is that silver canister shaped thing down there. You just unplug the idle motor and adjust the screw to around four, five, six hundred RPMs in that range. It shouldn't be down to almost zero or a thousand. About five, six hundred RPMs is where it should be, which it was. So we knew that wasn't the problem. The idle motor is doing its job. So that's not the problem. You can see these wires right here. They're green and orange. That is a throttle position sensor. It is not adjustable. You put it on and we tested the readings with it and it tested fine as well. The final thing that causes a lot of issues with these that are hard to track down is vacuum leaks. Luckily we have a smoke test machine here that we connected to this. It doesn't take much of a vacuum leak guys to raise the idle three or four hundred RPMs. You could test it with your own vehicle while it's running. Just unplug a small vacuum line and you can literally hear the idle shoot up 300 RPMs. That's all it takes. It can be very small, a small vacuum line, and it'll change the idle dramatically. So that proves right there, you don't have to have a vacuum leak the size of your thumb to make a difference. It can be very small. Any of you old timers out there remember the days of the quadrajets or the old carburetors when the throttle shaft bushings would go out. They would run rough, it was unchecked air getting in, and it would also make the idle erratic. You could get the idle just perfect, you'd hit the gas a few times, and then the idle would be different because the throttle shafts are now sitting crooked or sitting at a different angle, allowing more or less air in. And this throttle body on this truck is no exception. It is not a carburetor, but it still has throttle shaft bushings, which on this truck are bad. And it's a common issue on these older 5 liters, 5.8s, as they get age on them, especially over 100,000 miles, a lot of air can get in. Magic Mike hooked the smoke machine up to this intake and we saw no vacuum leaks except for right out of the throttle shaft bushings. Actually where the throttle position sensor is down below and also up here where the throttle bell crank is, smoke was literally pouring out. Based on that data, I could start the engine and have the idle just sitting there around 1300 or so and I could wiggle 
the throttle shaft, and the idle would change. That's when I knew it's time for a new throttle body. Between the map sensor, the diagnosis, the throttle body, which is four or five hundred dollars by itself, and then you got the labor to switch everything over, we were going to get close to eight hundred bucks or a thousand bucks. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, you would normally think this truck ain't worth that, Car Wizard, but it is now. You can't get nothing running and driving for eight hundred dollars anymore. It is worth fixing on this old truck. And the customer actually gave the okay. So I went to an online parts supplier, and just like it happened so many times, they had a throttle body for this truck, like 400 and something dollars. It said in stock. So I clicked buy. I had the okay from the customer, so I had no, no uh, question. I said, yeah, I'll take it. Then I get an email the next day. Oh, by the way, we don't have any of these, and we won't have for another two years. It's like, wait, it said on there that it was in stock. I emailed them back. You said it was in stock. Yeah, I know. Our system just hasn't been updated. I may have to take this off and see if I can just do the throttle shaft bushings, but that'll be quite a bit more expensive. And the only thing new he's going to get out of it, it's just bushings. The rest is still going to be old. But it may, I may not have a choice on this. And we'll see what the customer wants to do. But if you guys have any ideas in the comments, let me know a link where I can just go buy a brand new one. And don't send me a link without having checked that they actually do have it in stock because it'll be a waste of both of our time if I order it and they say, oh, hey, bro, we actually don't have that. So Car Wizard, what happens if you just absolutely can't find one for the next six weeks? Can the kid take it back and drive it? Will it hurt anything? No, it won't hurt anything at all. It'll just have an erratic idle. Sometimes it'll be perfect. Sometimes it'll be 1100. Sometimes it might be 13 or 1400. It's just like the old days on the old carburetors. Every time you hit the gas and it returns back down again, the idle is different. Normally the idle motor could adjust for this, but it can't adjust that every single time you let off the gas, it's at a different setting. And it's trying to keep up and it's, it tries to keep in its memory, the keep alive memory that, okay, this setting gets this RPM. And then the next time you hit the gas, it's different. And it's like, wait a minute, what in the, what in the world's going on here? It's hard for it to compensate for that. So if I can't find a throttle body, I'll, I might try throttle bushings and see if I can even get those. And if I can't, he may just have to take it as is. We did solve the rolling surging idle with the map sensor, and we did improve the high idle with the map sensor, but it's still a little high. There are many things on this truck, like rough idle. It can be fuel injectors. It's common on these to fail. This is an engine or an era that you really need to get your voltmeter or your oscilloscope out and test, test, test. You have to test everything because you can go through $1,000 in parts and you still didn't fix it. It's really a big problem with these older cars. So how many shops do you know of in your area that work on Ferrari 458, Dodge Vipers, and 1990 Ford F-150s? We don't discriminate here. You bring us a car, and if we can fix it, guess what? I'll take your money. Obviously, in exchange for proper, good, honest work. We're not just going to take your money. There are some shops that do just take your money. We will take your money here, and we will properly fix your car. So I thought this would be a really good video for you guys. It doesn't always have to be Ferraris and Lambos. There's these trucks on the road that need work as well, and we're happy to fix them. And in this weird inflation thing we're going through, it's getting to be more and more that it is worth to keep these old trucks and cars on the road. If you're curious what kind of tools we're going to use to fix this old truck, check my Amazon affiliates link in the description below. We get a small cut and we really appreciate it. And make sure to hit the subscribe button because when you have such a big range of cars coming and going, you're also going to have a big range of videos coming out. Thanks for watching.